so this is the Open Policy Agent introduction session. So I hope everybody's here for the, the OPA intro session. If you're not here for this, uh, it's a good time to, time to leave. Um, so before I get started, uh, how many people here have heard about OPA before? OK, uh, a few of you. And is anybody using OPA today? Or have you actually tried it for a POC or an experiment or anything like that? OK, one, one person? OK, great. So I think everybody here is in the, in the right place. Uh, hopefully, we can help you out as well. Uh, so my name is Torin. I'm uh, an engineer at Styra, uh, and I'm one of the co-creators of the Open Policy Agent. Uh, Styra is the company that created Open Policy Agent, and I'm, I'm an engineer there. Uh, I work primarily on OPA. If you've been on the OPA Slack, then you'll know me as T Sandal on there, and on Twitter, my name is uh, Sam Torin. So uh, before I dive into to the details, uh, what I'm going to do is just kind of give an overview of OPA and, and the background. Uh, so and the project itself was started in uh, the beginning of 2016 at Styra. And the goal of the project when we started it was to basically provide a building block that would help unify policy enforcement across a range of different technology. And over the last uh, year and a half or two years, we've had a lot of growth in terms of the number of end users that are using the, uh, the project to solve all kinds of different policy use cases in their organizations. So today, uh, companies like Netflix use OPA to enforce access control over internal resources, over internal microservice APIs. Companies like Chef are using OPA to deliver IAM capabilities in their products they ship to their customers. Uh, and there are dozens of companies like Medallia and Cloudflare and State Street and more that are all using OPA to enforce all kinds of policies or guardrails or constraints over their platforms, over things like Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so today, OPA is being used for a variety of different use cases around admission control and API authorization and more things like risk management. Um, and, and it's now a CNCF incubating project as well. So as of April, it was promoted up from the sandbox, which we joined last year, uh, to incubating. And we have about 60 different people that have contributed to the project. Uh, we have over 900 people on our Slack organization. Uh, we've got over 2,000 stars, and we have over 20 integrations with other projects in the, in the cloud-native ecosystem. So just to kind of motivate the problem and, and kind of explain why OPA exists, uh, imagine, you know, imagine you have a large application, right? You have a microservice-based uh, architecture, and you, know, you have some portal which your customers connect to, right? And they, maybe they connect to that portal to, to buy things for their pets or to do all kinds of you know, online shopping or something like, like that. Um, and that application is, is implemented by a set of microservices, right? So you have a service that does payments, right? It processes all the payments that the customers are making. Uh, you have a service that handles account data. You have a service that deals with promotions, a service that does notifications, that talks to partner APIs. Some of these services talk to uh, you know, internal databases that you're running, like, like MySQL. Um, others talk to external services like S3, right? So this is a very typical kind of architecture from in modern organizations, right? Um, now, the problem is, is that today, somebody like Alice, a developer, um, often has complete access to all of the services that make up that application, right? Uh, Alice is a, is a developer at the company, uh, and so she often has to troubleshoot the services that make up the application. Uh, and so she has complete you know, access to the portal and all of the payment services and account services and so on, right? Um, and so this, this, is, this is important because Alice often needs to debug these services and access them and do things with them. But at the same time, it's, it's risky, right? Because if she decides that she wants to look up Bob's credit card number or she wants to look up Bob's private information, um, she can do that, right? She has a lot of permissions in the system. So to address that, uh, what we want to do is put you know, authorization or access control checks in each one of these locations, right? So we'd, we would want to go into the payment service and add API authorization. We want to go into the account service and do the same, and so on and so forth, right? And in some cases, we might have to deal with external authorization systems like S3, right, or AWS IAM. The problem, though, with having to go in and, and do authorization or access control in every single one of these services is that it, it raises a number of questions, right? It might be easy to do it. Uh, in one service on its own. But when you look at a large application, you know, in a large organization, there are all kinds of questions that come up um, when you're thinking about access control and authorization. So for example, you know, what do you do when uh, the in information security department comes along 
um, and they have you know, new policies for you to enforce. Uh, what are you doing legal or compliance have the same, right? How, how, do you, how do you address this across a large range of services? Uh, moreover, how do you delegate control to your end users, right? How do you give end users the ability to specify the policies that govern access to their, to their data? How do you roll out changes to the policy, right? The policy is going to change at some point. Um, that's just a fact. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? Do you have to you know, release a new version of the, of the service? Uh, well, that might, be, that might be complicated or painful, right? You want to just make a change to the policy. Moreover, how do you access, you know, how do you write policies that leverage external context, right? A lot of the time, the policies that make sense in large organizations depend on, you know, external databases or external context within the organization, things like, you know, an HR database or an application database and so on, right? So how do, you, how do you get that kind of data down to the policy engine? How do you get it into the policy engine? How do you make use of it inside of the policies? Um, you know, and also, like, how do you render UIs based on policy? How do you test your policies for correctness? How do you know that the policies you've got in place are actually doing what you expect them to do, right? And, and how do you do this, you know, when you have hundreds of services written in dozens of different languages that have all kinds of different, you know, identity protocols that they use to authenticate users um, that run in different kinds of execution environments like containers and bare metal and so on and so forth, right? Uh, but the problem doesn't really stop at the application layer. It, it also exists at the platform layer, right? So this, this application happens to run on Kubernetes. Um, and again, Alice has kind of full access to Kubernetes, right? She is responsible for providing configurations to Kubernetes that define you know, ingresses and pods, and she controls network policy for her application, and she is responsible for creating persistent volume claims and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, well, the problem with giving Alice direct access to compute storage and network resources is that a lot of things can go wrong, right? Alice can create an ingress that conflicts with another ingress in another namespace. And so suddenly, uh, when she creates that conflicting ingress, traffic is no longer being routed to the right place, right? It's going to her development, uh, her development instance. Um, she can easily run you know, vulnerable uh, container images with known vulnerabilities, right? There's nothing stopping Alice from just saying, uh, deploy this image from, from Docker Hub and, and run it, right? Uh, there's nothing stopping Alice from instantiating a network policy that allows outgoing you know, egress traffic to any IP address in the world, right? There's nothing stopping that. Uh, and again, you know, Alice isn't stopped from, or she, she can instantiate pods that don't put any limits on CPU and memory, right? And so you can have runaway um, resource usage, right? So there are all kinds of different policy concerns um, across the stack, right? And so this is why we, why we created uh, the Open Policy Agent at Styra, was because we wanted to provide a building block that would help unify policy enforcement across a wide range of services. So you know, if you look at um, different services or, or technology today, they typically have their own you know, access control or policy or authorization systems. And the problem is that if you're in a large organization, you have every single one of these components in your, in your system. And so to manage the access control rules becomes very difficult because you have to go into each one of those systems and, and modify the policy, right? Well, wouldn't it be better if we had one kind of building block, one policy system that could plug into all these different components um, and that would give you basically a single way, a centralized way of managing policy? So this is why we created OPA. We wanted to basically unify policy enforcement across the stack. Uh, and so this is, this is just a picture that we, that we often show. This is an example of you know, all the different kinds of integrations we have with OPA. Uh, we have integrations with Kubernetes, obviously, for admission control. We have integrations with various uh, microservice frameworks uh, and, and service mesh projects. Um, we, we have people using OPA to enforce policies on public clouds uh, with things like Forseti uh, and Google Cloud and Terraform. Uh, and then we have other, other integrations for, for use cases like data protection and data filtering and so on. So, uh, what, is, what is OPA exactly? Well, OPA is what we say, we call it a, a general purpose policy engine. And what that means is that it's uh, domain agnostic. But to understand it simply, um, we can look at a single service. So say you, know, you were responsible for implementing the salary service within your, within your company, right? So this service is responsible for serving salary data uh, for employees, right? So the service exposes an API that allows you to look up the salary for any given uh, employee, right? So you can send a get to the service uh, for slash salary slash Bob, and you provide your credentials in the authorization header, uh, and the salary service will return the salary for that, that employee. Uh, but obviously, when, when you look up an employee's uh, salary, 
you know, that needs to be authorized, right? You don't want anybody to be able to see your salary. Um, and so that, that, that authorization process is a policy decision. And so with OPA, the way this works is that the salary service queries OPA for the policy decision, for the authorization decision. Uh, and when it queries OPA for that decision, uh, it supplies a bunch of attributes. Uh, and so in this case, it would supply things like the HTTP method from the incoming request, the path from the incoming request, the user that's making the request, and so on, right? And so then OPA will take those attributes and it will evaluate them against policies and data that you've given to OPA to produce a decision like allow or deny, which it'll send back to the service to be enforced. So the important thing to keep in mind with OPA is that uh, policy, what it does is at a high level fundamentally is it decouples policy enforcement from policy decision making. And once you do that, once you've decoupled enforcement from decision making, uh, it opens up a number of interesting opportunities. Now, when we say that OPA is general purpose, we, we really mean it. When we say it's domain agnostic, we really mean it. Um, so I was talking about the salary service a second ago, um, but you could substitute salary service for all kinds of different components. You could be, it could be a, you know, it could be an API gateway. It could be a service proxy like Envoy. It could be a custom internal microservice. It could be, you know, an SSH daemon. It could be, um, you know, an object store like Ceph, right? Um, this is why we call OPA domain agnostic because it can plug into all these different kinds of services. Uh, now, in order to make that work, uh, we made certain design decisions when we started OPA, and one of them was that OPA itself wasn't going to be coupled to any uh, project or domain-specific data model. So the attributes that you supply to OPA in the policy query can be arbitrary JSON values. You can supply any JSON data you want in the policy query. Um, method and path and user are not special in any way. They're just JSON data that gets supplied as input to the policy engine. Uh, and then similarly, the output from the policy can be any JSON value. So a second ago, I showed true or false being sent back, but you can generate numbers, you can generate strings, you can generate large complex objects that represent your policy decision. So OPA itself basically helps you decouple policy enforcement from policy decision making. Uh, and it does that by remaining um, you know, domain agnostic. Um, it sees JSON data coming in in the queries. Um, it sees JSON data being evaluated. And it sees JSON data being sent back to the service for enforcement. Uh, now, when you use OPA, uh, the first thing that you, come encounter, that you encounter is OPA's policy language. Uh, and that language is called Rego. Uh, and Rego is basically a high-level declarative language that is purpose-built for OPA. Um, that is really good at expressing policies or answers to questions like, can user X perform operation Y on resource Z, right? Or, you know, which rules, which invariants would this workload violate if it were to be deployed? Uh, or which records should Bob be allowed to see? Um, so I'm going to show an example of Rego in a few minutes. Uh, but the thing to keep in mind is that it's a high-level declarative language. Um, and it's really good at basically letting you write constraints over you know, large sets of JSON data, large unstructured sets of JSON data. Now, when you actually use OPA, um, you have different options. So um, conceptually, they're all the same. But depending on your use case, um, some options make more sense than others. So if you're building services in Go, you can actually embed OPA directly as a library inside of your service, uh, just as a Go library. Um, but if you're not building services in Go, then you can run it as a daemon. Uh, and we typically recommend that what you do is you run it as a sidecar container or a sidecar daemon or a host level daemon. Um, so the model is very similar. Either it's, either it's a library embedded inside of your service or it's a daemon that's running next to your service, ideally on the same machine. The reason that we recommend that you do this, the reason that we recommend that you take OPA and you run it next to your service is that it reduces the impact on availability and it reduces the impact on performance. If every single time your service has to make a policy decision, it has to call out over the network, then there's going to be a lot of latency introduced into the request path, right? And if you're building like microservices, for example, you know, there might be several microservices involved in the handling of a particular application request. And if at every single hop in that chain, you have to call out over the network, then it's, it's going to blow your, your SLA. You're not going to be able to meet your, your, your SLA. Similarly, if OPA has to, call, or rather, if your service has to call out over the network every time it has to make a decision, then the network might get slow, it might go down, the host that OPA is running on might die, and then your service won't be able to get policy decisions back, and so it's going to basically fail close, and you're not going to be serving traffic, right? So you're going to have downtime. 
So OPA from the very beginning was designed with this model of um, acting as a host local cache for policy decisions. What it does is it enables distributed policy enforcement. You take OPA and you run it next to your service. Um, in order to make that happen, we made certain design decisions again. So the first of which was that all the policy and data that OPA uses to make decisions, all of that is kept in memory. When you ask OPA for a policy decision, it has all the data and the, and the rules it needs to resolve that, that query and send back an answer. Um, so it's not going to call out when you ask it for a decision to another service. It's not going to ask another service for more data um, on its own. You can extend OPA. You can, you can in your policy, you can uh, do an HTTP call out to get more data. And you can extend OPA by, by, plugging in, by adding a plugin to it to call out to get more data. But on its own, it's not going to do that. On its own, it has all the policy and data it needs to make decisions in memory. Now that obviously begs certain questions, which are, you know, where do the policies and data come from, right? You can't just have the policies and data sitting in memory uh, and hope that it never, it never goes down. So in order to get policy and data down to OPA and in order to control and observe OPA, uh, we have a set of management APIs. Uh, so for example, we have the bundle service API, which you use to send policy and data uh, down to OPA. Basically, uh, OPA will uh, periodically call out to the bundle service and ask for the latest version of policy and data. And if, if there's a new version, then it gets downloaded. Uh, we have the status service API, which you can uh, implement to receive status updates from OPA. Those status updates tell you uh, whether well, the version of policy and data that OPA has activated, that it's currently running with, right? So you can use this to detect, you know, is it up to date? Are the OPAs up to date? Or have they encountered errors in trying to activate the most recent bundle of policy and data? And we also have a, what we call the decision log service API which you can implement to receive audit logs from OPA. So every time OPA makes a policy decision, it keeps a record of that policy decision, and then it periodically uploads batches of those, those decisions to, to the decision log service. Uh, and so that, that decision log service is useful from an audit perspective, now, because now you have a record of all the policy decisions that have been made by all the OPAs in your system. Uh, but it's also useful for capturing data for things like debugging and test purposes. Uh, and then in addition to all the, the management APIs, we have tooling that help you basically build, test, and debug your policies. Uh, so we have an interactive shell that you can use on the command line to experiment with policies. We have a test framework, so you can actually write unit tests for your custom policies, which is really useful for you know, making sure that your policies are correct, right? Part of the idea behind OPA is that policies should be treated as code. You know, just like you want to treat infrastructure as code, OPA basically delivers policy as code. And so we give you a, you know, a test framework that you can use to write you know, unit tests for your policies. Uh, and then we have a bunch of other tools, command line tools, that you know, format your policies, do all kinds of semantic checks, uh, as well as IDE integrations. So if you start writing policy for, for real, I recommend that you check out the VS Code, Visual Studio Code plugin. Uh, it's, it's very powerful, and it helps you kind of interact with the policies inside of VS Code very nicely. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is run through a quick example of how you would implement policies inside of OPA. Um, and so the policy that I'm going to implement says that employees should be able to read their own salary, as well as the salary of anyone uh, that they manage. Uh, and so to do this, I'm going to use uh, the, the OPA Playground, the Rego Playground. Um, this is a new service that we, that we created earlier this year. Um, and the service has some nice features that I'm going to kind of run through and explain, explain, to, explain to you as I go. Uh, so this is the policy that you see when you start off. And I'm just going to delete that. Um, and so to implement this policy, remember we want the first rule basically needs to say that uh, employees can access their own salary. And the second policy says that employees can access the salary of people they manage. So to implement the first rule, um, what I'm going to do is create a rule called allow. And I'm going to say that allow is true uh, if the input, actually wait, let's back up a second. In order to test this out, I'm going to have to define some input data. Um, and so the, the Playground lets you do that. It lets you put um, input data in the browser here. And so I'm going to say that, for example, the input method is get. Again, this is just from the slides before. And the path, say, is salary uh, Bob. So this is a lookup for Bob's salary. Uh, and I'm going to say the user making the request is Bob. So to write the rule for the first case, um, what I'm going to do is say, uh, I'm going to say the, the rule is called allow. And allow is true um, if input method is get and input path 
is salary employee ID. Uh, and input user is employee ID. Oops. So this rule says allow is true if input method matches get, and input path matches salary employee ID, and input user matches employee ID. So the expressions in the body of the rule are anded together. The interesting thing about this rule is this, this employee ID here. Uh, so this employee ID is a variable. And what happens when OPA evaluates rules is it looks for bindings for those variables, values for the variables that make all of the statements in the body of the rule true. So for it, in this case, in order for allow to be true, all the statements in the body of the rule have to be true. So OPA is going to search here to find whether employee ID can match all of these expressions. So one of the powerful things about the, the playground is that you can evaluate it um, here. So I just clicked output, and it'll take a second. Um, and you can see that today, right now the output is true, right? Because I've, I've basically got Bob looking at Bob's own salary, and so that should be uh, allowed. Uh, but if I change, the, change this and I say Alice is looking at Bob's salary, oops then it's undefined. The reason it's undefined is because none of the statements in the body of the rule match. So typically what you'll see in OPA policies is something like this. They'll say default allow is false. So this means that if allow doesn't match, then it'll take this default value on. Uh, and now if I go and I evaluate this, and we wait for the network. There we go, now it's false, okay. Now, one of the powerful things about OPA is that you can actually evaluate pretty much any part of the policy you want. Uh, so if I don't select anything and I just ask for the output, you can see that it basically prints allow is false. So what's happening here is that OPA is basically telling you the values of all the rules in the body. And right now, we only have one rule. It's called allow. Uh, but you can actually go further than that. So you can actually select parts of the rule uh, and hit evaluate, and it'll print the answer. Um, what, what do you think is going to happen when I do this? It's, now we've got a variable inside the, inside the query. Well, it's going to tell us the value of that variable when the rule got evaluated. And in this case, it got bound to Bob. Uh, and so if I go and I select the last one, it's going to be undefined because obviously input user does not equal Bob. It doesn't equal employee ID. OK, so that's, that's the first part of the policy. Uh, to implement the second part of the policy, we're going to need to do a little bit more. Um, so we're going to need some data in this case to decide whether or not uh, one employee is a manager of the other. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just define that data here in the policy. Uh, I'm only going to do this because it makes it easier to kind of show and to interact with in the playground. Typically, this kind of data would be loaded into OPA just as raw JSON. It wouldn't be encoded inside the policy. Um, or it would be passed as input. So like in this case, you know, the management chain for an employee could just come inside of like a token or something like that. Um, so in this case, we'll say that Bob uh, is managed by Alice and Fred, uh, and Alice is managed by Fred. So I've defined this as basically a map of strings to sets. Uh, and so Bob is managed by Alice and Fred, and Alice is managed by Fred. Now, in order to make use of this data, I'm going to add another rule. Um, and it's going to just be called allow again. So we're going to say allow is true if input method oops, is get. Uh, and input path is salary employee ID. Uh, but this time, instead of checking whether the input user is the employee ID, I'm going to check whether uh, the input user is a manager of the employee. And so to do that, we're going to do a lookup on the managers. So we're going to say, give us the manager, or rather the managers for the employee. And then we're going to ask whether the input user is inside of that set. So uh, one of the things that you'll find in Rego that's very frequent are these, these references, we call them. Um, these are basically performing lookups on these JSON uh, documents. Uh, and so now, if I go back and I refresh the policy decision, now it's true, because Alice is a is a, a rather the manager of Bob. Uh, if I change this to Bob and I tried to get Bob to look up, say, Fred's salary, that would be rather, that'll be denied. So the allow will be false. Uh, now, typically, uh, if I was doing this for real, I wouldn't just test everything with, with the input data here. 
what I would do is I would write a bunch of test rules um, to, to verify that the behavior is correct. So I would say, for example, allow must be true um, when given certain input. Uh, so for example, when uh, you know method is get and user is Bob and the, the path is for Bob's salary. Uh, and so then I can go and evaluate that. Oops, it's a parse error. Sorry, with input as, there we go. Uh, and so here you can see that test allow is true because the statements in the body were held. And so I would basically build up uh, a bunch of these test cases to ensure that the logic that I expressed above was correct. Oops. All right. So that is it for the demo there. Um, when you uh, go to start using OPA for the first time, you might be looking for integrations with existing projects in the ecosystem. Uh, and so we have a, a number of them. I think there are over 20 or 25 now. Uh, we have a number of integrations with different projects for doing admission control. Uh, that's one of the main use cases that people have for OPA today. They want to enforce different kinds of policies over their platforms. And so for that, we have integrations with Kubernetes. People use OPA with Terraform. We have another integration with Docker that's very similar. And the idea there is you just want to enforce certain policies over configurations that developers are supplying you know, when they deploy their applications, right? So you want to say things like only you know, container images must come from the corporate image registry. Uh, or you want to say that all workloads need to have you know, CPU and memory limits supplied when they're, when they're deployed. Or you want to you know, prevent conflicting ingresses from being created, for example. Uh, the other main category of use cases we have is around API authorization, typically in microservice environments. Uh, and so we have a bunch of different integrations with projects like Istio and Envoy and Kong and Linkerd and Spring and more. Um, and the idea there is that you want to you know, provide, you know, obviously, IAM or you know, access control policies for your, for your internal you know, environments. Uh, and so you want to, you know, you know, for example, deny test scripts from accessing production services. You want to you know, prevent analysts from accessing you know, sensitive data and so on and so forth. Um, but we have a long list of other integrations. So for example, we have a, a PAM plugin for, uh, for OPA, where basically you can enforce, uh, you can use OPA to enforce access control policies over SSH and sudo. Uh, we have one uh, user of OPA where basically they, they have a policy in place that says that uh, developers are only allowed to SSH into machines that are running applications uh, that that developer work, works on, right? And there has to be actually an open ticket for that for that application at that time. Otherwise, they can't get on the machines. And that, that just resolves like a long-standing problem in system administration of people getting added to, to net groups and things like that and then never getting taken out, right? So this way, you, know, you have a flexible kind of context-aware method of enforcing policy over SSH and sudo. Uh, and then we have a bunch of other pro uh, integrations with projects like Ceph and Kafka and Minio for doing different kinds of data protection use cases. Um, you know, a lot of large organizations are building out data lakes internally, uh, and there's definitely a need for you know fine-grained attribute-based access control there, and OPA uh, really enables that. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is just highlight a couple of the uh, you know users that are that are running with OPA today in production. Uh, we talked about some of this a couple of months ago at the CNCF TOC meeting, but I'm just going to kind of highlight them again here. So. One of the users of OPA today is Netflix. Uh, they were one of the earliest adopters of the project. Uh, and today, they're basically using OPA to enforce a variety of different access control policies across their you know, internal environments. Right? So they, they have a large microservice-based environment. And uh, they, you know, they, developers there use a variety of different languages and frameworks. Um, and they have different kinds of execution environments where, where these services run. Um, and so the, the challenge there was to find you know, a way of expressing policies over this very heterogeneous and ephemeral kind of um, you know, environment. And so they, they looked at OPA and they decided to adopt it and, and build it into their internal security platform. And what they found was that the ability to you know, leverage contextual information to load arbitrary context into the policy engine and then use that to inform policy decisions, they found that very, very valuable. Um, and they, they found it very valuable to be able to use a single language essentially to express policies across a wide range of, of different languages and frameworks. Um, and so we have a, actually a talk from KubeCon Austin 2017. If you're interested, interested to see how they're using it, um, check that out. Um, another company that's using OPA today for a, for a similar but different use case is Chef. Uh, so it's again, it's an API authorization use case, but it's a little bit different because Chef is obviously a, a software vendor. Um, they ship you know, software to enterprises. And anytime you ship 
a, a software product to an enterprise, you have to deliver IAM functionality. You have to deliver authentication and authorization and accounting. Uh, and so for Chef, OPA basically provides uh, an engine, a building block that helps them get to market faster. They don't have to go and reinvent this, this authorization engine from scratch. They can basically take OPA and with a bit of policy in place, they're able to deliver uh, an AWS IAM style policy to their customers um, inside of their products. Um, and actually today they're also using some more advanced features in OPA like partial evaluation. Uh, and so I, if you're interested in this, I would check out, uh, it's actually open source if you go to Chef Automate on GitHub you can find uh, examples of that and how they've architected it. Uh, and then finally, uh, an example of a company that's using OPA for Kubernetes is Intuit. Uh, so Intuit uh, you know, uses OPA as a validating and mutating admission controller in Kubernetes. Uh, and they use it to enforce a variety of different security and multi-tenancy and risk management pro policies across um, a large set of clusters and a large set of namespaces. Um, for them, they run, you know, large multi, they have large multi-tenant workloads deployed on, on Kubernetes. And it's very important that they're able to put kind of safeguards in place to prevent different, you know, applications from interacting with each other in, in bad ways. Um, and again, we, we did a talk with them at KubeCon Seattle in 2018. So if you're interested in admission control and Kubernetes and how companies like Intuit and Capital One are using, uh, using OPA for, for that, uh, check out that talk. Um, so that's it. We've got about four minutes left for questions. Um, I'll point out that there are two talks later today that are related to policy. So one is the talk on Gatekeeper by Craig Peters at Microsoft. That's at 6.15. If you're interested in how uh, you can use OPA to enforce policies in Kubernetes for admission control, go to that talk. Uh, I think it'll be really interesting. Uh, there's also the, the Kubernetes Policy Working Group uh, deep dive session from Howard at Huawei happening at the same time. So uh, you'll have to pick which one you want to go to. But both of those should be great sessions. Um, if you're interested in the code behind the project, check out openpolicyagent uh, slash OPA on GitHub. And if you have questions or anything like that, feel free to join the Slack organization and post your questions on there. So uh, with that, uh, I'm happy to do some Q&A right now if anybody has questions. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for coming. Question? They want it recorded, so oh, sorry. Hi, uh, do you have any integrations uh, where this can be mapped to OAuth claims? So the claims are given out based on policy? Uh, to, to generate claims or to validate claims? I guess both. Both? Um, there, are, there are people looking at using OPA to generate the claims that go into a, into a token. Um, you can definitely do that because ju that's just JSON, so it's just a different kind of policy decision. Um, we don't have specific examples of that on the website. What we do have, though, in OPA, uh, is a set of built-in functions for doing things like string manipulation and math and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we also have built-in functions for interacting with JSON web tokens. So if you want to basically pass a JSON web token as input to the policy and then inside the policy, you know, um, verify the signature and validate things like not before and expiry and all that, you can easily do that um, within, within the policy language. Uh, I'm not sure if you know there was another product created by Pashcom named uh, Sentry, mm -hmm. right? But it's also a product related to policy as code. Mm -hmm. Can you do a quick comparison between OPA and uh, Sentry? Sure. So the, the question is, uh, you know, how does OPA, Open Policy Agent, compare to Sentinel, which is a, a HashiCorp's policy as code uh, project? Um, and uh, the answer is that they're, they're both similar. They both um, aim to you know, allow, you, allow you to express policy as code. Um, I guess the main difference at a very high level is that Sentinel is, you know, it's a closed source proprietary um, feature of their enterprise HashiCorp products, right? Uh, so it's not open source. Um, and it's really, I think, focused at those kinds of policies that you apply to, you know, the platform, right? To HashiCorp projects, right? Like Vault and Terraform and, and so on. Um, so OPA is a little bit more uh, general purpose in that you can kind of use it as, a, as a, like a building block, a library for all kinds of different policies at different levels of the stack. Um, at the language level, there are some differences. OPA is a little bit more declarative, uh, whereas the Sentinel language is a little bit more imperative. It's more like uh, JavaScript, um, which has pros and cons associated with it. So uh, I can, I'm happy to chat about that more uh, offline if, if, if you're interested. But uh, it's, it's a fairly long answer, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think there were a couple of questions at the back. Hi, just a quick question. Uh, if I'm to uh, embed OPA into embedded device with the 
relatively constrained to memory. Uh, do you have uh, any idea about the size of the OPA code base uh, or the binary or the image? So the, the binary is about 20 megabytes uh, in size. Um, so the memory usage is, is fairly low. Uh, it's about 20 megabytes if you're just running it without anything inside of it. Uh, obviously, the, the amount of memory that it's going to consume at runtime depends on how much policy and data you load into it. So it would kind of depend on the types of policies you, you need to express. Um, but it is, it is fairly lightweight. We don't have very many dependencies in the project itself. Um, it, it's written in Go, so I don't know how, how that would work for your environment, but um, that's one thing to, to keep in mind. Um, I will mention that one of the things that we're working on that's more speculative or more long-term is support for taking the OPA policies and compiling them into WebAssembly. Uh, and so with that, I think we might be able to deliver like an even smaller memory footprint uh, for, for the policy evaluation. So uh, a question, you had an example on, on uh, how to implement policies across the enterprise mm -hmm. where you can look salaries just for the people you manage. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you said that some organizational structure can be imported into OPA using a JSON structure. Yeah. Uh, would that require some reboot, some restart of the service, or it's all seamless from the, from the uh, application perspective? Uh, so it, it should be it can be hitless. Um, so there are two ways of loading policy and data into OPA. One is through the bundle service API that I mentioned. Um, basically, OPA will periodically download policy and data from a remote service and reload it on the fly without affecting policy queries. Um, the other is that you can push policy and data into OPA. It has an API that allows you to just push policy and data in through an HTTP API. Um, that works. It's a little bit more complicated, I think, though, to design that. Um, into your system in a, in a way that's uh, you know reliable and correct. So we generally recommend people start with the bundle uh, service model, and then you know if they need push kind of capabilities later on, they can always always add that. Um, uh, so, and yeah. the other question w would be: Do you push all the policies to all the microservices, or you can push just uh, the p the policies that they relate to that microservice to that? that OPA? That's a good question. So so OPA itself is just the decision engine. All it does is it just says, given the policies that you give it. Uh, you know, answer answer questions, right? It doesn't decide which policies go down to OPA, right? So that's sort of up to you as the implementer of the control plane around OPA. That's sort of up, that's sort of the challenge uh, that that we don't tackle within OPA itself. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, one more question. Uh, okay, I think we're a little bit over time. I'm happy to answer offline. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. So it's uh, giving, uh, giving is making a lot of decisions in the organization. So can be facing a lot of volume. So it has to be quick, uh, very very fast. Yeah. So do you have a general idea about, about its performance? Like how long does it take to make a decision? Uh, yep. So we we sort of have two profiles for for OPA policies. Uh, one profile is kind of or, um, what we call li the linear time profile or linear time fragment of of OPA, and that's sort of targeted at API authorization policies. Um, if you do write your policies in a way that is, is that falls into that fragment, then OPA will index the, the rules for you, um, and it can answer uh, policy queries in like under 100 microseconds in a lot of cases, or under a millisecond is usually our budget. That's the number that we got from Netflix. Um, the other category of use cases is like more around platform kind of policies over, say, a Kubernetes cluster, and in that case, you often have to do a large search over like the state of the cluster in order to make the decision. And so there, the, the budget for, for latency is a little bit higher. Uh, because of that search operation, right? So it depends on the on the use case, but typically under a millisecond for API authorization. Okay, thank you. Okay.